animals in our spaces, so do whatever feels comfortable, please. Um, we are ready to get started and we are aiming to record this session so that um, people may have access to it. Uh, I think we may still be working on that technical part of starting the recording. But I think we can go ahead and get started so that we can um, stick within our one hour. So everyone, thank you so much for being here. This is a behind the scene visits to the DC's Art Bank collection. Um, we'll discuss the acquisition process for the Art Bank, the collection management um, process, and also the outgoing loan program. Uh, I'm Sarah Gordon. I'm the curator here at the Commission on the Arts and Humanities, or CAH as we call it. We have several other people on the team today because it takes a team to present a WebEx. Uh, my co-presenter today is Ron Humbertson. He is the Art Collections Registrar. Hi, everyone. Uh, hey, Ron. Our administrative host uh, today is David Markey, who is handling the tech, and he is our deputy director. Um, keeping us informed and on time is Vanessa Ackham. She is public art program specialist. And guiding us through the Q&A periods will be Khalid Randolph, who's our grants programs manager. A couple of technical notes. Um, I believe you're all entering the room on mute. And we would like you to stay on mute for the most part, just to avoid too much ambient noise. But we would love to have you participate. Um, you can drop questions in the chat box at any time. You can use the raise hand feature if you'd like to ask a question aloud. Um, also, the closed captioning, I believe, is on for you. And you can turn that off by clicking the X um, in the black box. Um, if it's not on and you want to turn it on, I think there's a little blue guy in the lower left corner and there's a CC box next to him. So you can click on that. All right, so I'm going to start um, sharing my screen and we'll get into it. All right, Ron or David, give me a thumbs up if this is looking like a PowerPoint. Thank you. Great, so welcome to our program for today. I wanna to mention that today's program is part of a three-part series on the Art Bank. Um, the first part happened a month ago on February 4th, and that was a visual history of the district's Art Bank collection. We talked about kind of the history of forming the collection. We talked about some of the wonderful pieces and the relationships relationships among the work in the collection. Um, it was recorded and is available um, on our website, as you see here. And then the third session of the Art Bank uh, Trio is happening on April 15th. And this will be more of a workshop, um, visual art grant application, Steps to Success. We will talk about how to photograph artwork, how to um, uh, put together a portfolio, writing an artist statement, writing a CV. And for that event, we do have three panelists lined up. Uh, the panelists will be Zoe Charlton, uh, Marcel Taylor, and Catherine Mann. Zoe is a former Art Bank panelist, and then the other two are um, have been successful grantees um, in various public art and visual art grant programs. So this is not just for Art Bank, it's for any, really any visual art grant that you're putting together. Okay, so I want to start today um, talking about the acquisition process. And I should say that I'll be starting, I'll talk for 10 or 15 minutes, take some questions um, about sort of the incoming process of artwork. And then Ron will take over from there and talk about the, the care of the work and then the outgoing loan program. And then we'll take questions again at the end. So as a curator, I have to say that the um, process for acquiring work to the art bank is a unique one, um, unlike anything I experienced before, and that is because it is a grant program. So um, in order for someone to bring art into the art bank, um, they need to apply for a grant. And like our other CAH grants, um, the call opens, and then there's a certain period in which um, you can apply, and then it closes, and then we go into our panel review process. So. Um, for this, for Art Bank, for the upcoming cycle, we're scheduled to open the call um, in early May. 
So if you're on our mailing list, if you follow us on social media, you can keep your eyes open in early May for that. Um, and once it opens, it will be available on our website, the guidelines um, and the application instructions. So I wanna talk a little bit about the grant overview and goals so that you have a sense of what we're looking for when we do acquire work into the art bank collection. Um, the grant is, is to support local artists and also galleries and nonprofits. Um, and we acquire artwork from these artists and nonprofits into the collection. The work is then owned by CAH and loaned out to district government agencies for display in public areas and offices of government buildings. So if you're out in you know, any government building in DC, you're likely to see Art Bank work on the walls. Of course, right now we're not out in government buildings and I'll talk a little bit at the end about other ways in which you can see um, the Art Bank works. So there, the goals of the, of the program are threefold. Um, first, to build the collection. And we really want the collection to reflect the rich, diverse artistic history and communities of this region. Also to provide support, exposure, and professional benefit for visual artists who are living in the DC metropolitan area. Um, this is actually the one grant at CAH that is open beyond the borders of DC um, to artists in Maryland and Virginia within a 50 mile radius. Um, and then to enhance the aesthetic experience for district employees and visitors who are coming into these buildings and public spaces. And you know, this is really the key to what public art is and does. Um, and it, you can think back to you know, the Works Progress Administration during the 1930s and the New Deal and this push to put art into um, federal government buildings as a way to you know, just allow the public access to these works of art. And I wanna to talk to you about the criteria that we use to determine whether works will come into the collection. Um, again, it's a panel review process. And so when an artist or, a, or an arts organization applies, they see these criteria. And then when the panelists are evaluating the artworks, they base their evaluations on these same criteria. Um, the most heavily weighted in this case is aesthetic and conceptual strength. So we want art worth, artwork with exceptional visual impact and technical skill, conceptually inventive, intellectually stimulating, um, and also it needs to be pr produced using archival materials, and this is for conservation um, purposes. So the second criteria is artistic contribution. Um, I know this page only totals 80%. Don't worry, we have 20% more coming on the next page. Um, so as far as artistic contribution, this can be different things. Um, you know, there can be an artist who applies who has a really extensive exhibition history, whose work is in high profile collections, who's contributed to the artistic community over the years. There may also be artists who apply who are emerging artists who are very promising, um, whose work you know, who the artist would benefit from being in the collection and the collection would benefit from acquiring these work. So we're really aiming for this richness um, and diversity in the collection. And then the third criteria that we look at is value as cultural asset. And this is um, kind of includes a lot of different things. We wanna make sure that the work presents the cultural diversity um, within our community. Um, Sometimes we want, sometimes the work demonstrates the global reach um, of the district. Sometimes it represents the cosmopolitan nature of DC itself. We want to be sure that the works that we're bringing in really stand out as markers of the city's evolution and artistic trajectory so that our collection represents the art that's made in the city throughout the years. Um, right now, we we used to say that we would collect work that was made within the past three to five years. Um, and we've changed that a little bit because we're interested in work that is made now that's contemporary, that's the artist's you know, current work. But we're also interested in bringing in work that might be older, but that has a real significance to the art history of this um, city and this region. Um, and then we wanna make sure it's a fitting addition to a municipal collection displayed in public buildings. So that's another um, consideration as far as how and what we are able to show, you know, we don't have gallery guards in every building. We can't be changing light bulbs every, you know, couple of weeks. And so there are some limitations as far as what we can um, display. So 
So if one does decide to apply for the Art Bank grant, um, one is directed from our website to the grants portal. Um, some of you, I'm sure, have a lot of experience with the grants portal, for better or for worse. Um, but it's a great way for CAH to bring in and track and evaluate um, grant applications. This is just a screenshot of what kind of the opening screen looks like um, when you get into the portal. And so again, the, the process of submitting an application is something that we'll go over um, in our next workshop. And also once the call, once the um, call for applications comes out in May, we hold specific grant workshops um, where you can come in and we will kind of walk you through the process of submitting your application. So I'm not gonna go into that in detail today. Um, I wanna move into the panel process so you can kind of see what happens on the other end. Once the applications come into us through the portal, then we enlist um, a group of panelists to review them. And the panelists are arts and humanities professionals um, in the region. We often for Art Bank will include um, district employees who might be working in the kinds of buildings where they would encounter um, these art objects or who we've worked with before on placing objects in buildings. Um, and the panelists are really there to review and score the applicants content um, based on those criteria that we just talked about. When we bring together our panelists, we aim to bring together a diverse group of people that really represent the district and the applicant pool. Um, and so what you see here is um, a little plug. If you're interested in becoming a panelist, you can visit our web page. Um, the sheet on the right that you're seeing is what you would fill out submit a resume, and then we may reach out to you. So when we reach out to panelists, we both reach out to people who have submitted in this way, and we also um, reach out to you know contacts that we have in the community. So what the panelists see um, after an applicant submits their application is something like this. They get into that same grant portal on kind of the other end they see artwork, they see all the documents and information that's been submitted along with it. And that's how they make their first evaluation. So with ArtBank, it's actually a, a two round panel program. The first round, they look at everything online. Um, it's, we get lots and lots of submissions and each artist can submit up to five works of art. So, um, you know, these panelists are doing amazing work. They're just going through all of these artworks. Um, and really adhering to the criteria, it's a really fascinating process um, to go through. And then the second part of the art bank panel process is after we, after the panelists look at everything in the portal and they score everything and we work out all of our um, numerical magic, uh, we come up with a list of finalists and the finalist artworks are brought into our gallery space um, by the artists. And we hang them in the gallery space and the panel comes in for a second review. And so then they look at the work in person. Um, it's really impossible, as you know, to purchase artwork without seeing it in person. There's so much more that you can tell about its structure and appearance and texture and um, you know, the way that it's assembled when you see it in person. So these are just some shots of, of our art handlers hanging the works in the galleries so that the review panel can come and take a look and do their second round of review. And again, they follow the criteria, they follow the um, sort of question of um, how it looks in person versus how it looked on the screen. Um, and also we try again to make sure that the work that we're bringing in um, is representative of the diversity of our community. So we bring in work from artists from all eight wards of the city, as well as Virginia and Maryland, artists who are working in various stages of their career, different styles, different media. You know, we have a great balance of gender and race and ethnicity in our collection. And so those are all, of course, considerations when we're bringing in work. This year, um, because the gallery was closed, we did hang the work and the review panel did come in in a safe, organized manner to review it. Uh, but we also then 
put the work, we installed it in our virtual gallery, which it's almost hard to tell in these pictures, the difference between the actual gallery and the virtual gallery. But what you're seeing now is the first installment of the finalists exhibition in our um, virtual gallery. And that exhibition was titled DC Art Now 2020. And I'll just for fun show you a number of images. The first installment was mainly um, paintings and, and works of art that were hangable. And then the second installment, this is the second installment here, was um, a lot of photographs and works on paper that we couldn't actually hang on the walls. And so when we did the panel review, we had them laid out on tables for viewing. But um, because of the magic of the internet, of the web, we were able to hang them in the gallery in the virtual space. And that's what you're seeing here. So again, these were the finalists um, for this year's Art Bank. Some of them were acquired and some were not in the end. All right, so I am happy to take some questions. Um, Ron and I are both here to answer your questions. Oh, I see someone waving a hand. I see Carol Morgan waving a hand. I have a question. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I I uh, would like to apply for a grant from the DC Commission of the Arts. Is there any rule that excludes uh, people from Maryland or Virginia? I live in the district, but I would be working with someone from Maryland. So uh, the Art Bank grant is the one grant at CAH that does welcome applications from a 50 mile radius of DC. So including Maryland, Virginia. Um, the other grants at CAH are all limited to within the district. And I should say that if there is an arts organization or gallery or nonprofit who is applying for the art bank on behalf of their artists, that organization needs to be located in the district. Right, and I wanted to say if you're if you're applying for a project grant, such as our PABC program, if you are a DC resident, but working with someone outside, as long as you are the main grantee, you can work with artists outside, I believe, um, but you can follow up with our colleague, Alyssa Maru, if you're interested in applying for a PABC grant. Uh, let's see, Lauren Glover, I see your hand. Can you unmute yourself or shall I unmute you? I think I just sent you a request to unmute. Yes. Hello there. I just wanted to very quickly thank Sarah for, for this introduction, um, for, for the presentation. But I also wanted to acknowledge that there are a couple of members of the commission on this call, um, including the chair of the Public Art Committee, Alma Gates, and a very, very dear member of our committee and commission, Mariah Rooney. Um, and I don't know if there are others, but I just wanted to acknowledge their presence and thank you all for coming. This is um, this is a, a really big crowd and it's, it's so exciting to see so many people interested in Art Bank. Thanks, Lauren. Um, Lauren. I'm the, oh, go ahead, Sarah. I was just going to introduce you. You, Lauren, is the uh, teacher of public <laughs> art. <laughs> thank you. Okay. I know some questions have been coming in on the chat. Khalid, I don't know, I know if you want to pull some of those up. Yes, I have them. Uh, so the first question in the chat is, how much is the price of artwork taken into consideration during the application process? Uh, that's a great question. We've had different um, kind of regulations about pricing over the years, and our current um, our current regulation is that we will not purchase any work of art over ten thousand dollars. So that's kind of the cap on the pricing. And then within that um, $10,000, we basically need to know that the artist is submitting their appropriate market pricing. Next question is, how can I find out where my work has been placed? Oh, that's a great question. Um, maybe at the end, we can take a look. So basically, you would go to our e-museum um, and I think Vanessa might be able to drop that uh, web link in the chat. 
if you go to our e-museum and search your name or you can search a title, um, then it will bring you to the work of art and it will show you um, where it's located. Right. It will only show you the current location. So it might have been installed in other organizations. And one more I'll give you. Uh, have you considered presenting a curated exhibition of the Art Bank's collection in a local museum or nonprofit so residents of the district can see the art? That's another great question. Um, I have a couple of answers to that. Um, one is that in a way there are curated exhibitions all over the city. So, you know, the way that you can see it and they're not curated by us. You'll hear more about how those end up where they are when Ron speaks. Um, but there are kind of all these mini exhibitions throughout the city and all these government buildings. Um, but I will also say that we do on occasion curate exhibitions um, from the art bank and there's one coming up this month. Um, opening on March 29th, it would typically have been in our in our galleries at 200 I Street, but again, it, it will be on our virtual gallery and it is called our city ourselves women photograph Washington. So this is an exhibition of female photographers um, pictures in and around Washington DC. I have a question. Oh, okay. can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. So I'm an LLC, um, but my operations are social enterprise. Um, I do social justice, environmental democracy, um, art promotion, things like that. Um, so would I qualify for the grant? Yeah, I will be presenting the art. Um, we may want to talk a little bit more. Um, I'll, I'll put my email up at the end and you can reach out, but generally we can we can give grants to llc's um if you're a if you're a nonprofit, um sometimes we have individuals who i think are llc's and so we could we should probably discuss it reach out to me okay thank you okay. yeah um i have a question it's tiana clark okay oh yeah um, i see you. Um, we have an LLC and we're actually located. So we're in Maryland, but we're literally a traffic light away, like not even a mile away from DC. Do you make exceptions for that? Unfortunately, we can't, you know, I would advise maybe if one of your artists. Well, if your artist wants to apply outside of the LLC, that might be a better way to go because we can't make exceptions for organizations outside of the district. Okay. Um. Good. Well, this is great. Maybe I should turn it over to Ron because he's got some way more fun stuff to show you and um, then we'll have more questions. All right. Thanks everyone. So, you know, get comfortable. It's going to be a while. It's going to be a minute. <laughs> I don't know if you want to go ahead and share that first slide, Sarah. So. Once Sarah is completed with facilitating the grant process, my work begins as a registrar, you know, managing the new acquisitions into the collection and through the art bank loan process. You know, first I begin uh, cataloging each artwork and you can go to that first slide. So this includes, you know, confirming measurements, recording signature and locations, uh, noting the addition if applicable and doing an overall visual inspection for condition. You know, I also assign two numbers and a session DC and a session number and a DC property number to each artwork. I do this because the artwork is part of a permanent collection, which is the accession number and the artwork is tracked and insured as a district asset, uh, which is our DC property number. Works acquired into the collection remain in the collection and are not sold. Uh, only if the artwork is damaged or beyond repair with conservation, for example, Cobb would go through a deaccessioning process standard with collection practices. So, sorry, we do not sell the artwork that's in our collection. I'm asked a lot, uh, but I'm happily, and I, you know, I connect them with the artist if possible, or get them to their website so they can look at, you know, get in contact with the artist if interested. So, on your left, uh, you see me busily cataloging a work um, that was part of the recent Corcoran donation to the city. This is an oil on canvas by Edward Corbett called Washington DC, July 1964. 
So these works, along with our new art bank acquisitions, uh, will be up shortly to our e-museum site. Um, so keep an eye out towards the end of summer to see that uh, those new parts of our new collection. On your right is a new art bank acquisition for FY20, and uh, that I was recently cataloging, and it's a diptych by artist Holly Bass, which is an inkjet print. Uh, it's called Jump Down. So next slide. So where does all that information go as, as I'm cataloging? That would be in our gallery system collection management software, um, also known as TMS, uh, where I enter the 20 plus catalog fields of each artwork. Uh, I also track current location through this program as it moves through the loan process, along with value, along with condition, and with other collection details. Uh, this system is used internationally by museums, private and public collections, uh, including the Smithsonian, uh, who uses the same software for their collection record keeping. So it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty robust collection management system that I put in place when I started about seven years ago. So once I create or edit any public catalog record in the, into the system, within 24 hours, it will be live on our e-museum site, uh, which showcases our entire art bank and public art collection. Uh, here on the left, you'll see the TMS catalog record of Sam Gilliam's ship, and on the right, a screenshot of the e-museum website of that public-facing record. So here's some fun trivia. If you're all interested, you might already know. If you're in a museum and wondered where did you know they acquire this work or when, all you really have to do is look at the accession number. I mean, who really doesn't think of these things, right, when you're walking around in a museum? But standard accessioning includes the year followed by the number of work it entered into the collection of that year. So for instance, this piece had a, has an accession number of DCCAH, which is our acronym as an agency, 1988.001, indicating this work was the first piece accessioned in 1988. Uh, and if you attended the last session of this workshop, you'll remember that this was the first work acquired by CA um, in 1986, but then entered in 1988 as a full collection as it started. Uh, so next slide. So once I have everything cataloged, I move to that soft packing and organizing of the artwork into bins and to go out to our framing. So on your left, you see this stunning image of a packing organizer. I had this custom made for me when I first started at the commission. It rolls with me. It has everything one needs to pack art on the go. It has bubble, glassine, polyfoam, some cling wrap, uh, and below piles of tissue, which is of course asset free. So I know it's a thing of beauty. Uh, it has got me through a lot of a lot of days. Uh, so on the right is another new acquisition by Holly Pass here entitled uh, Crossing. I added some paper corners taped down with some blue tape for safety uh, as it is in transport. That was not me. Uh, <laughs> but here you'll see that it is layered with glassine and uh, mounted to that board off to the framer shortly. Uh, next slide. Once those frames return to me, I start unpacking them from the slip cases and cardboard sleeves with the protected work um, that the framers put on for transportation back to us. Uh, I inspect each frame, take final measurements uh, for our catalog records, and I stick a label on the back that has the object details. Uh, and then I hang them back up on our racks uh, for temporary storage awaiting selection. The collection is framed using all archival materials and UV plexi, sometimes with the highest grade of museum professional glass available. Uh, that is if the medium is really light sensitive. Uh, for instance, we have several works by artist Dennis Lee Mitchell that are drawn with smoke on paper. Those are the works that get that uh, very expensive museum professional glass. Uh, since the collection is installed in public space, we have to take those extra precautions as they are in open offices and not in museums or galleries. So everything is covered with UV plexi. Uh, even our wall mounted 3D artworks receive a custom box and a plexi. And if the sculpture can fit on a pedestal, a vitrine is custom made uh, for installation. So here you see on the left, a few works I just unpacked still with the bubble. Called New Domain by uh, artist Kyle Hackett. And the painting sort of peeking out from behind that work is a Judith Peck piece called The Divide. The image on your right shows a rolling A-frame rack that had some larger works that just came in. Uh, facing you is artist Helen Zugabe, uh, an archival print with gouache called Out of the Box. Next slide. Uh, 
So the, this is the image is what agencies see when they schedule an art selection date uh, to view the available artwork for loan. This is inside cost secured temperature and humidity con controlled storage, uh, AKA my second office. So the steps for the art loan program are pretty simple. Agencies submit requests that can range from new office loans, adding works, deinstallations, or relocations of the current loan. After discussing the request with them, I set up a office visit if, if applicable. I then schedule an art selection date with the office um, where two, possibly three, even more representatives will walk through these rolling racks with me to view the artwork in person. On the selection day, I work closely with them as a guide to provide artist backgrounds and stories behind the work as we go. And I do happily make suggestions if they are just not sure. But once selected, I place the work on hold and they go back to their office to finalize with their director and, and who they need to. Uh, but once confirmed, I schedule an installation date with our art installers, create labels and prepare the loan agreement. So the art bank collection, as Sarah said, re previously is currently only available for loan through government agencies, executive offices of the mayor, council members, and their committee offices. Um, you know, CA has loaned these artworks for museums and temporary exhibitions if we are reached out. Uh, for example, we have loaned a Jonathan Monaghan print to the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore for an exhibition a few years back. We do not loan the collection to individuals or offices outside the DC government, so no federal agencies, which can be confuse, confusing here in DC. Um, I, I do on occasion receive calls and while talking, discover their federal agency and, and I'm, sadly I have to tell them it's not available for them. Next slide. So a little bit more on the loan process, and I hope you're all still with me. Uh, agencies who take part in this program enter a minimum two-year loan and can request a refresh or add additional artworks for after that time. You know, this loan period helps the commission cut down on cost uh, for installation, coordination, as well as just the general care of the work from just constantly being moved. Most loans stay with the agency for longer as for longer because those pieces truly do become the identity of the office and, and people just fall in love with the piece and, and don't want to stop seeing it. The art loan program is a free service uh, and CA, to our to our government agent to our DC government agencies. CA covers all these associated costs with this program. The average loan to an office is about 12 to 15 artworks. However, larger offices that might be across multiple floors or buildings do request more and we do accommodate if the work is available. You know, I run the loan, the loan program as a first ask to first serve and I, I do keep people in mind if they're waiting on something special uh, they couldn't find during the selection process. You know, I've gone back to offices letting them know I have a work that I think would be perfect or work that might have just returned on loan that would be great in their conference room uh, if we couldn't address it at the day of their art selection and install. So on your left, you'll just see like another image of sort of the of a rolling racks open with my, you know, steady but rickety uh, <laughs> step stool there. And on your left, um, the, you'll see that. And then on your right, you will see sort of that clear box frame that I was talking about. On the those are on the wall there. Uh, you'll see works by Michael Crossett. Uh, I'm sorry, you'll see a work by Michael Crossett and sort of on your left, you'll see uh, two pieces by Michael Janis, uh, glass pieces, which I actually just installed at DDOT this week. Uh, in front of the sculpture, you might see a little pedestal there that I had custom made uh, for, gla for a glass piece by artist Alan Brenstock called Sivia Seed Seeding. Uh, next slide. So, to finish up sort of these sections uh, of, of my talk, I want to go through a little bit of the installation process and show a few images from my recent installations. So to install about 12 to 15 artworks, it does typically take about a day of work. You know, I arrive at Ka on that morning to meet the crew. We bend the work for transportation and arrive at the installation site. I make nice with the security and all the loading docks. It does wonders and I proceed to help navigate the installation crew through the various obstacles of just trying to get into government office spaces. On your left, you'll see another Helen Zubay print called Veiled Secrets being installed at the Department of Insurance Sec Securities and Banking. And then on your right, there's two works being installed by Gail Shaw Clemens. Um, this is being installed in the HR Director's Office 
for the Office of the Chief Financial Office Division. Next slide. So I typically deinstall and install about 15 to 20 locations a year. You know, busier years can go up to 30 locations. I was here when the Bowser administration came in and boy, was we busy for like that first three months. So for placement, some offices know exactly where they want the artwork. And, and typically I follow their lead as it is their office and, and their space. However, I am there to make objections and to provide uh, a new location if the artwork would be installed in a way that could cause harm to the work or to visitors. You know, such as moving the work out of direct light all day or shifting the artwork if it becomes an ob obstacle, uh, you know, from chairs or people bumping into <coughs> it. So if the office has no idea, I gladly step in and manage the entire overall placement. You know, I've had many delicate conversations on artwork placement, uh, but that's not, that's for another time. Uh, the work is installed with security hardware, so it is um, on the wall securely and you need a special key to get it off from the bottom. Here is a work being installed at DDOT this week, new office here over at 250 M Street. This is Sheila Kreider's monumental work, Untitled One. It's 84 by 60. Um, it's using acrylic, quilt batting, cotton thread, and vinyl cord. One of my favorites. Next slide. So here you actually see our own conference room at the commission, just to kind of show you other places that it goes into. You know, we typically, you know, install all the work uh, in hallways, uh, communal areas, conference rooms, and really pieces. We try not to put any pieces directly into people's offices unless they're the director of that agency. So on the back wall to your right is a really cool piece of DC history. If you lived in DC around 2004 and five, you may remember the graffiti artist that went by Borf. This is an original stencil of his work and it's called Grown Ups Are Obsolete. And it's accompanied by an aerosol on the board using that same stencil. Uh, next to this, you'll see um, over on the other walls a photograph by Jason Horowitz called Metro One. So next slide. <clears throat> so I mentioned previously, each work is accompanied by a wall label. Um, and hopefully you can see those wall labels here. Each label has the artist's name. It has the title as a year, the medium with the accession number and the DC property number and our agency name and the collection name. Uh, recently, we have expanded using the larger label which gives us the opportunity to provide a small statement for more background on select pieces, which Sarah as our curator provides. Uh, these two works, you can, you can see those ex sort of expanded labels there. Uh, we also begun providing a PDF document that has a statement about each of the artwork for the office as a whole to their loan. So this gives them a chance to know more about each of the artwork and they can easily share this with staff or for visitors uh, who might be interested in, uh, about the piece itself. And again, those are, you know, created by Sarah. So here is a D dot installation that I just did this week. On your left, we have a piece by Marsha Wolfson Ray entitled Apparition using dog fennel. There's another piece that's kind of by her as well that's creeping into that side. And on your right is a work by Santiago Flores Tronico called Invocation. Um, and I believe he might actually be on this. I saw him pop in, but it's made of acrylic paint sequences and um, beads on assembled canvas. It's a gorgeous work in the light. So if you can go to the next slide. This is my last slide, so thanks for bearing with me. This is just another final installation in an agency conference room. This is a piece by Jordan Wine called Vesica Fiscus IV, made with glitter and adhesive. So I know I sort of went through a lot, um, so hopefully you kind of bared with me. Uh, in closing, I sort of wanted to say, you know, through our art loan program, um, I have seen firsthand how it really transforms what could be these draft government offices um, that are open to you to come to go through. It's, you know, into these warm, inviting spaces. It showcases all of our local artists and provides a greater access to art for the public in a very unique way. The art in this collection brings so much joy. Uh, it, it really is one of the best moments of my job when I step off an elevator and into an office space with their new loan. And I can hear sort of echoing excitedly down through the office space that the art is here. So that's sort of all I have right now, and I'm happy to take any questions.
questions if you have any. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Um, so do you need, like when, when an artwork get damaged or something, do you have to use local uh, restoration mm -hmm. for it? Uh, artists mm -hmm. that can help you with it if the artist is not around? Absolutely. Yeah. If, if a piece does get damaged, we will do a call to a specific conservator that either can work into, into that medium or work with the artist to find the best source if, if there is damage. So, yes, we do that. And how, how, another question is how, you know, if people, do people need to get, I mean, these artwork are in the offices. So if you go to do a business in, in one of the government offices, then you don't really get to see the public don't get to see the art. I mean, it's just because most people don't have access to get into the offices of the government. Um, how do how do we see any particular piece or the demo line? Yeah, so most uh, most of the pieces. You know, most of the offices do are open to to visiting. You could call and make. You know, we could help make appointments to go see the ARC if they see the art if they're in, you know, public spaces that aren't. But most of the work is in open government spaces of offices that, you know, you can you can walk in and see. And most of them are in hallways, conference rooms and. and Oh, I see. And various, yeah. So there, are, there are in offices where you, 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 you can walk through and see if there might be some pieces that might be behind some closed doors that might be in director's office suites or conference rooms. But I think you could easily make, uh, if you, if you want to see that person, you can easily make an appointment to probably see. Thank and, you. and, and the loans are constantly rotating, as I said. You know, sometimes they do remain with the office. Sometimes they're they move out after that two year, two year period. Oh, that's good. <laughs> and I would just add, I think you mentioned also how to see the work online. Um, if you are able to see the chat right now, um, Vanessa just dropped in a public service announcement with a bunch of links and one is the DC Arts E-Museum. And that is where you can go to see all of the work online. Um, and again, maybe if we have a couple minutes at the end, we can um, explore that a little bit. Sarah, I have about 13 questions here. <laughs> Uh, so it will run through some of the ones I think that the hands are going up. I'm going to ask all the ones. And he, uh, take questions. I'll get back to it. Uh, so the 1st question is. Do you have a preference for a certain size of art or type? For example, presented uh, a representation of. Khalid, you're breaking up a little bit. Um, maybe I'll continue the question. There was a, a, a question about your preference for size and materials, and then there was a related question about freestanding sculptures in terms of the sort of the size, weight, that type of thing. Yeah, I don't know, Ron. Do you want to take it or or let me take it? Whatever you. It's up to you. Sure. So, and we have sort of looked at that a lot, and and we're sort of reevaluating that as we go, as we sort of work with this collection. Um, in the past, it you know it was about uh, you know eight eight feet in length that we wouldn't. I think we're starting to narrow it down, because it does get a little challenging as big as the piece gets. It's it's hard to place large sculptures, for instance, in public space. We do find some unique lobbies and suggestions for those pieces that we've had in the past. Um, so, Sarah, I can't remember what is our current, um, I think our weight limit is about 50. Yeah, sorry, as, as Ron said, we're, we're always kind of refining our guidelines and our 20 FY 22 guidelines are about to come out. And so we have some new guidelines on weight and size. Um, I think it's, um, what is it? 60 or 80. I don't have it in front of me. I'm so sorry. Um, but when those guidelines are out, um, you'll see that they're very specific size and weight um, limitations. And as far as sculpture, we've been discussing that lately as well. You know, one of the most important things that we need to attend to when we are putting artwork out in public spaces, again, without gallery guards or anything in the space, is ensuring the safety of the pieces. 
Um, and Ron showed you the kinds of plexi that we use to cover the work. And so even with sculpture, we need to be able to protect it. Um, and so we are starting to limit sculpture to works that can be shown either on a pedestal or on a wall. Right, and we have to some. We also have to work, you know, because we are in an office based on sort of those ADA regulations. So we can't have anything over like six inches that kind of come out. So if we do have a piece that is wall mounted, you'll you remember back to my image that Marsha Wolfson Ray, those were installed under a cabinet. So an inset into a wall. So that way anyone can't bump into it if, if they have vision impairment. And I was just going to add, I mean, the ultimate goal is we want to get the work out to be seen. So we don't want to collect things that we can't show. So that's another reason, you know, to be mindful about about sculpture as much as we all love it. Um, if it's if it can't work in a in the setting as intended by Art Bank, then we're really not doing it any justice having it in storage. OK, here's another one. It's the general size range preference for smaller pieces, what are the smaller size which has been selected? There is no size limit. I mean, you can go small if you want. That might need a magnifying glass. That would be really cool. Um, I think the smallest piece we might have is about, you know, three to five inches. So we have gone small and, you know, there's space for everything. Um, their office spaces have various walls. You know, of course, we get people to come in and say, I want the hugest, most colorful thing. But then, you know, when we get to their office and we can't get it in. <laughs> so size of small is not is not an issue. It's really the size going over a certain length. Awesome. Are there particular uh, materials or techniques that you consider red flags for conservation archival region? Uh, where is quote the line well i think we have to look at i mean i would have to just look at each piece and and medium at the at the time but we want to make sure that it at least has a a life of at least 10 years um you know some photographs they're going to start fading and, and changing you know we do put things in uv protection and try not to put them in light but nothing will be here forever um so we want to sort of limit anything that will come apart easily by touch or movement. Uh, if it's not sort of glued down appropriately, or if you're using sort of like a glue and not sort of an archival glue and you can see, see it already starts sort of peeling and coming apart. So it, it's really sort of a on basis, but if you're using sort of the general art, art mediums and you should, you should be fine. But if you're sort of going outside and using something that um, would basically deteriorate within five years, um, then, then it, would, it would be a red flag for us. Approximately how many artworks get acquired each year? How competitive is the review process? So me and Sarah can bounce off this one, but I, I think we generally collect about 60 to 80 pieces a year. And it's quite competitive some years, you know, when I started, you know, some, some years we have 150 to 200 applications. So Sarah, I don't know if you have a little more on that. Yeah, no, I would echo that. Um, I mean, I've only been here a couple of years. Typically we've brought in about 60 to 70 works, but it has really varied over the years. Back in, I think it was 1999, we brought in like a couple hundred pieces. So uh, we don't plan to do that again anytime soon, but um, it does vary a little bit how much we brought in. Um, as far as how competitive it is, you know, as Ron said, this year we had, I think, about 160 applications. Um, each applicant submitted about, you know, up to five works of art. So if you do the math, which I can't do off the top of my head, um, it's a lot of artwork. And then we bring in 60 of those. And so, you know, that's not to be discouraging because we bring in works by different artists each year. We are always bringing in works by new artists. Um, we're also, there are some artists who we've collected over the years as their as, as their careers have evolved. And so it's always worth applying. Um, if you if your application is not successful in any particular year, you can always request a debrief. Um, and that means you get feedback from the panel. So, you know, it's a great process to go through if you haven't before and are considering it. Okay. What was the name of the program to catalog the process? 
Oh, it's called, um, it's by a company called Gallery Systems, and it's called TMS, or the Museum System. Do you purchase original pieces? All our pieces are original, yes. Do you put the plexiglass, or I'm sorry, do you put the plexi on original paintings? We put plexi on everything. Um, it's not directly on the painting itself. So our, our frame will use spacers. So when you frame an artwork that might have plexi, it will be inset within the frame. And then there's a there's a um, something that inside that will push the plexi out to the surface. So it's not actually touching, but yes, we do. And it can get quite expensive when we have an 80 inch piece for plexi. <laughs> Do, agents, do agencies include libraries and schools? At the moment, uh, we do not. I think there's maybe one or two libraries that might have a piece that was loaned to them in the years past, but our current loan program is only for DC agency offices under that. So libraries and schools are not included currently. All right, that's all that I have right now. I would have to go back into the chat because I see questions have uh, materialized in there. Excellent to get some far. Ron, there's another question just about do you prefer work to come to you framed or unframed? Unframed. Unframed. Okay. We we do frame everything, so you don't worry about submitting. And if, if we do acquire a piece that is framed, I try to get the frame back to the artist once we we take it out. If the work is already framed and you're submitting it, um, I wouldn't recommend that you unframe it. You know, just send it in framed, but but know that we will uh, reframe it to our specifications. I wonder if we if we take a couple more questions and then maybe we'll have a few minutes to look at the um, e museum. Is there a target amount of pieces CH will select this year? There is not, you know, just like we were saying, it really varies. There are a lot of variables as far as kind of what our budget is and, and how the scoring works out. So um, there's not a, a definite number we're looking for. I see a question too about, is there a subject theme that we're looking for? Um, I think there have been a couple of times in the past when we've done themed calls, but um, it's not something we're planning to do this year or um, in the near future. We really want to see the best work by any given artist and the most kind of current work that they're doing um, to see really what, you know, again, to get a flavor of what artistic practice is in DC um, at this moment in time. I know that CAH will own the art, but do we still own the rights to the image or are we required to sign that over? Good question. Question. You, the artist so, maintains the copyright um, to their work. Right. In in the grant agreement, you, we do ask for a fair use of that image. But you still own the copyright. And also, just to add, if we ever use the image, we credit the artist. Absolutely. Just as, yeah. as Ron was walking and Sarah walking through their presentation today, those artist works were named. Sometimes we use it. Um, in our annual reports or other kinds of um, things. We did a series of videos this summer about Art Bank, and so all the artists were identified there. Sarah, there is a question here that I think is kind of an uh, interesting question, and I'm just going to throw it out to you. They say, can artists in the collection apply every year, specifically if it is uh, with work different than the one you already have? Absolutely. There's no limit on how often you can apply. Um, you know, we will, like I said, there's some artists who we've collected over the years as their work has evolved. Um, we will not collect kind of more of the same. We want to really have an array of an artist's work. But if your work is changing and you have new work, absolutely keep applying. You know, again, the panel is different every year. The makeup of the panel is different every year. Um, so it's kind of nice to have different eyes on your work. Um, it's, you know, the process takes a little effort, but I think once you've done it once, then it's probably not quite as cumbersome to do it a second or third time. Um, you know, and again, you can always get feedback um, if your application is not uh, successful in any given year. So what I would like to do actually is, is maybe share my screen again um, to show you the e-museum. 
Uh, let's see. Ron, what are you seeing right now? Yeah, I see the, the website. You do? Yeah. Okay, great. So what um, you're all seeing right now is the what we call the e-museum. This is the portion of DC um, CAH's website devoted to the art bank. And as you can see, it's sort of presented here in different groupings. Um, the Wilson Building Collection, which I talked about a little bit at our previous um, event, uh, is kind of a subset of the art bank. Images of Washington, and I saw that there had been a question in the chat about the Washingtonia collection. Um, to this image of Washington um, set, and it's no longer kind of referred to as the Washingtonia collection. And then everything is here by the year in which it was acquired. And so you can click on any given year and see what was acquired during that year. This just happens to be FY 2015. Um, you can also search, you can search, you know, an artist. If we look for Gilliam, we'll get the Sam Gilliams in the collection. You can search a medium. Uh, if you search, let's see. You can search photograph and see what we have um, as far as photography. And so then again, if you click on the, um, the image, um, you can see where it's located. So this one is in the mayor's office on Latino affairs. Um, this is the accession number that Ron was talking about earlier. All right, so I encourage you definitely to um, explore the e museum, especially right now when we can't go into all of these buildings. Once the buildings are open again, I really encourage you to go and take a look around. Um, again, the Wilson building has the biggest portion of the art bank in one place. And so that's a great place to go and look. Um, another kind of resource I wanted to share with you as far as seeing more of the art bank works is if you go to YouTube, um, and let me just share the uh, PowerPoint again. Uh, as you see here, if you go to YouTube and search DC Arts, um, that's our YouTube channel where we have a number of videos that we've put together. Um, this was a project that started shortly after quarantine began and has been a way for us to share the art bank with the public. Um, there are, I think, about eight or ten videos up there now, and so those are kind of thematically grouped or curated um, groups of art bank pieces, so I encourage you to take a look there as well. Um, and just as we close here, I'll, I'll remind you that um, our previous art bank event from March 4th was recorded and is available. And it's more of a look at the artwork in the collection, how the collection was built. Um, and then our next event is happening on Thursday, April 15th. So I encourage you to sign up for that if you're interested in hearing from a panel of artists and panelists about best practices for assembling strong visual art grant applications. Again, this should be applicable not just to Art Bank, but to other CAH um, grant applications and really more generally just for artists. Uh, visual artists looking to obtain grants. This is my contact information and Ron's contact information. Um, please feel free to reach out if you have further questions. I know we didn't get to everything today. We never do, but happy to answer questions to talk about, you know, the next um, grant cycle or anything else you might be wondering about. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, Ron, any last closing words here? No, I just appreciate it. And um, if, if there's any, if you're an artist and you go on our e-museum site and you see anything that you would like me to adjust, please correct, you know, I'm a human, so there might be some things that might be incorrect. So just please shoot me an email and I can quickly correct it. And within 24 hours, it will be right. Right as rain. So I, I appreciate everyone's time. Great. Thanks, you all. Thanks so much for being here. All right. Thank you. Thank you.